Welcome everyone to the opening session of our digital conference, Queer Feminist Perspectives on Political Homophobia and Anti-Feminism in the Middle East and Europe. The conference is organized by Humboldt University of Berlin, uh, Brown University and the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. My name is Tunay Altai. I'm a PhD researcher in sociology at Humboldt University of Berlin and one of the co-organizers of today's event. In this opening session, I'm joined by my co-organizers, Gökçe Yurdekul, Katerina Golor, and Nadia Aylegi. I would like to start off by saying a few words about today's event. Um, Queer Feminist Perspectives Conference is aimed to offer a cross-regional and interdisciplinary platform for scholars, artists, researchers, and activists to discuss the emerging issues of gender and sexuality in the Middle East and Europe. We dedicated this year's conference to the far-right movements, authoritarianism and populism, and how they instrumentalize homophobia and anti-feminism to mobilize in the Middle East and Europe. Teasing the epistemological boundaries set between these two regions, our conference ventures into creating a critical dialogue that builds on the contextual and geographical complexities, the impacts of Europeanization, immigration, globalization, racism, and the histories of colonialism and imperialism connecting these two regions. In this respect, our participants' work engage with a multitude of subjects, Iran's monarchist and nationalist discourse, Ukraine's sex education debate, the place of gender and sexuality in far-right Israeli politics, and anti-gender and anti-feminist mobilization in Turkey and Poland are only some of the topics that we will cover in our conference. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic also played a major role in the planning of this event. As a crisis that shaped the political project of the far right globally, COVID-19 has shown how intersectional systems of oppression are reproduced and even further intensified while immigrants, women, LGBTQ, and other minority groups were being targeted and demonized in various contexts. In these two days, we will talk about systemic inequalities, discrimination, marginalization, and political exclusion of communities whose lives are affected by what some call the resurgence of far-right movements globally. Thinking through contextual entanglements between theory, activism, and art, we are hoping that these two days will lead to further research and writing in which we can collectively imagine queer feminist makings of new potentials and possibilities. With this note, I will now pass the mic to my co-organizer, Nadia Al-Ali, for her introduction. Thanks so much, Tunai. Uh, so I'm Nadia Lali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown, where I'm also a professor of anthropology and Middle East studies. And I'm really, really excited to be part of this effort. And I'm really particularly thankful to Tunai, um, well, and Gutschke, who approached uh, my colleague Kati Galore and myself here at Brown. And, um, you know, I guess uh, often we sort of in feminist circles speak about the importance of process, but I definitely feel that um, as much as I'm excited about the conference, also the process of organizing this and getting to know the team and thinking these issues through has been really important. And um, seeing on Monday, we had a meeting with some of the contributors and it was extremely rewarding to see how uh, various um, people from various regions, especially Eastern Europe and the Middle East, actually appreciated the opportunity to be in conversation with each other. And that's really one of the big goals of this effort is to de-exceptionalize, particularly the Middle East. I mean, it's still very much the case that, you know, we when we think about homophobia, when we think about gender-based oppression, there is, um, you know, this, this focus on the Middle East. While clearly these days, um, one of the things that has become more and more apparent is, you know, we can't think in terms of the old categories anymore, you know, the East and the West and the North and the South, especially when it comes to right-wing movements and um, the anti-gender and anti-feminist discourses as well as rising homophobia. So, um, in the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown, I have been trying more broadly to center gender and sexuality in trying to understand broader developments in the region. And I think what this conference will show is that if you want to understand authoritarianism, if you want to understand the rising right-wing uh, movements and discourses, we can't sideline 
uh, our uh, discussions and understanding of gender issues and, and also discourses and policies linked to sexuality. These are at the very center of what we see happening uh, more broadly. So um, yeah, I think with uh, this, I, I don't want to take too much time and I'm going to uh, now hand over to my colleague, uh, Kati Galor, who is also going to say a few words and introduce herself. Thank you. So I would like to add my words of uh, enthusiasm for this conference and my words of gratitude uh, to all of our participants without whose presence and contributions this event would not have been, would not be happening. And I would like to reiterate what um, uh, my colleagues have already stated, which is that um, as we have read the abstracts and papers that the participants have shared with us, the, the commonalities, overlaps, the parallels have really been astounding. And to, to some extent, it is, of course, what we anticipated as we thought of this meeting and as we put together the program. Uh, but the similarities across the countries and regions we're examining have really by far exceeded our expectations. And, and to build on my colleagues Tunai's and Nadia's point about de-exceptionalizing the Middle East in regard to discourses on and, and legislation of anti-feminist and uh, homophobic sentiments, movements and policies. I would like to add some concrete examples from my own field of expertise. One is uh, Israel's global political alliances with other countries on the far right spectrum of uh, political leadership, such as uh, Poland, Hungary, and Brazil that on the surface are uh, about shared economic, military, and social interests, which, however, when examined more carefully, seem to promote very similar conservative, anti-democratic, discriminatory, and racist views, including openly anti-feminist and homophobic trends and policies, and another example would be Germany and France, Europe's leading powers considered models in the defense of democratic values and human rights, yet who in recent years have tolerated, if not embraced policies and political parties that promote anti-feminist and homophobic discourses and movements. And perhaps one more comment in our on our um, participants in this conference, those who are here in this virtual space and those who cannot be with us. As we prepared this meeting and also when we met last Monday for a pre-conference workshop, I was struck by the differences in positionality. While we are all deeply committed to and invested in combating anti-feminist and homophobic expressions and realities, whether as activists or scholars. Some of us are more privileged and secure than others. Some live under occupation, others in hiding in exile, in discriminatory contexts under physical and legal threat. And finally, there are those who were hoping to share with us their work who could and could who, who actually could not hear, be here with us today for reasons of safety. And I feel it is important to keep this in mind as we gather here in this virtual space and engaging topics that are important to us, debates that will hopefully contribute, even if only modestly, to shape a better future for all. And I almost forgot, I'm Kati Galo. I'm a senior lecturer in Judaic studies at Brown University. I'm trained as an art historian, an archeologist working primarily in Israel, Palestine, and also more recently in Germany with an interest in cultural heritage, religious politics and gender. And I'm delighted to be a co-organizer and participant in this um, really amazing conference. Thank you. 
Now it's uh, Gokche. Would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yes, thank you um, to the organizing team. My name is Gökçe Yurdokul. I'm the director of Institute for Social Sciences at the Humboldt University of Berlin. And I'm also a professor of sociology at the Department of Diversity and Social Conflict and Berlin Institute of Migration and Integration Research. Um, after these uh, three very interesting uh, interventions, I want to focus on a specific theme that uh, came a lot during our conversations, and that's what's happening in the universities. And um, this is the place that I am located right now, uh, my office at the Humboldt University. Um, universities are not places of study, but also places of political movements. Um, without transformative power of politics, the study in the university does not have a meaning. Let me give three examples from the universities that our participants are coming today. Due to, the modif um, due to the modifications of Hungary's law on higher education, Central European University was not able to operate legally in Hungary and moved its US accredited programs to Austria, specifically gender studies department, which I, was, I had the honor to be in the accreditation process. It was, tar it was a target of conservative politics in Hungary. It was banned in Hungarian university education and the whole program had to be carried to Vienna. A second example comes from Turkey, uh, which is my alma mater and also uh, Tunay's alma mater. The university affiliates who named themselves as Academics for Peace were dismissed from their academic position and flee to European and North American countries. They had to convince media that they are not refugees, but scholars at risk. And some of them are among us today. Still struggling to find places for themselves in the new academic system, their careers are results of politics that demonizes universities and in being intellectuals. More recently, the renowned Boazici University had to politically struggle for months to overthrow a university president who was appointed top down by the government. An LGBTQI plus flag was repeatedly shown in the media as a symbol of freedoms. A third example comes from Poland. In 2020, the education minister Czarnek said that the funding may be cut to the universities that facilitated university affiliates to participate in pro-abortion protests. University academics in Poland are protesting Czarnek, saying that LGBTQ people are not equal to normal people. Things are not better in German universities. In my own conversations in various meetings, I have to repeatedly justify the significance of gender and diversity related to research and teaching for securing freedoms in my own university. In fact, little has been said in the current election campaign in Germany, which will take place on Sunday, about securing freedoms and the difficult situation in German universities with limited staff, constant push for university staff to bring external funding, and lack of perspective for early career researchers. These are some of the themes that makes this conference so important. In the umbrella term of queer feminist perspectives, one of the issues is that brings us here today is to talk about how we critique anti-democratic and authoritarian governments in order to secure freedoms in the universities in a global context. So I am very happy to be with you here and I am looking forward to the excellent papers that we will discuss in the next two days. I'm giving the word to Nadia El Ali to um, uh, introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gacha. Yeah, I mean, I'm so excited and happy that I'm able to introduce Professor Denise Candiotti to you all. Um, before I'm going to give the more official version, I say I'm particularly excited and happy because I um, feel that I owe a lot to Denise, who was my not only my PhD supervisor, but has continued to be a mentor and friend. And I'm very much indebted to her scholarship and her thinking that's often controversial, that's often pushing uh, boundaries. Uh, sometimes we don't agree, but she always makes me think. 
So Denise Candiotti is Emeritus Professor of Development Studies uh, at SOAS, uh, formerly known as the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. She holds degrees from the University of Paris, Sorbonne, and the London School of Economics and Political Science, LSE. She was also on the faculty of Middle East Technical University from 1969 to 74 and Bukhacici University in Turkey. She has worked on Turkey, post-Soviet Central Asia and Afghanistan. And I should say, you know, if you're interested in contemporary situation of, in Afghanistan, I strongly urge you to read her work on Afghanistan. She has developed comparative perspectives on state, gender and power in the broader Muslim world. Denise has made key theoretical contributions to analysis of patriarchy and male dominance. She is the author of numerous articles that, um, I mean, if you teach a course on the Middle East, a course on gender in the Middle East, her articles have to be on the syllabus. She's the author of Concubines, Sisters and Citizens, Identities and Social Transformations, the editor of Fragments of Culture, the Everyday of Modern Turkey, Gendering the Middle East, um, the Pathbreaking Woman, Islam and the State in 1991, and more recently, jointly with um, my colleague and friend Catherine Spalman Poots and myself, Gender Governance and Islam, which is an edited volume and builds on Women, Islam and the State. Uh, Denise has also acted as consultant for UN Women, UNDP, UNESCO many other organizations uh, and monitored the gender effects of the uh, Arab uprisings from 2011 as guest editor for 5015 Open Democracy. So it's my great pleasure to now welcome Denise to give her keynote. Thanks Denise and welcome. Thank you, Nadia. After such an introduction, it can only go downhill, I imagine. <laughs> um, what I would like to start my presentation with is by taking you on a guided tour of selected vignettes that I believe illustrate some of the conundrums of my title. This past June, Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte declared that Hungary, and I quote, has no business being in the European Union anymore after it passed legislation banning LGBTQ content in schools and the media. Admittedly, this came at the tail end of a decade of systematic democratic backsliding. The MIT economist, Daron Ajemoglu, argued forcefully that the European Union should begin the process of expelling Hungary and to start considering doing the same to Poland, which is set on a similar course, lest it makes a mockery of the European project and everything it stands for, considering that support for populist parties has roughly doubled across Europe in recent decades. This obviously opens a hornet's nest of thorny issues. Earlier on, I was struck by an article titled Sex, Violence and the Rise of Populism, published in the Financial Times in 2018, precisely because it appeared in a publication that does not ordinarily deal with gender issues. It noted the militantly misogynistic tone of populist movements in the United States, Brazil, the Philippines, and Italy, among others, referring to outrageous statements made by a variety of leaders, such as Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil, Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines, Matteo Salvini, a dominant figure in the Italian government of the time, and of course, ex-US President Donald Trump. Images of a bare-chested, horse-riding Vladimir Putin, the patron saint of state-sponsored homophobia, and jibes about rape and assorted sexual slurs started appearing in the political rhetoric of male leaders and were regularly reported in the popular press. Even scholars of populism with little previous interest in gender issues started taking note of this strongly gendered discourse and its blatant appeal 
to a frail masculinity threatened, as Casmode puts it, by emasculating feminists, effeminate liberals, or overly virile others, such as blacks or immigrants. We now find ourselves in a 21st century assailed by the spectacle of deeply polarized societies across the globe, where what is at stake are vital issues such as our understandings of citizenship, national belonging, and the future of the polity. Co-citizens gaze at each other with mistrust and sometimes revulsion across chasms that have often been willfully cultivated by leaders hankering after unchecked executive power. In the conflict-torn societies of the Middle East and North Africa region that have been victims of multiple foreign interventions, sectarian divides are weaponized with deadly consequences that feed flows of refugees and migrants, further entrenching xenophobic and exclusionary rhetoric in the receiving countries. A recent addition to this dismal landscape was the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan. You might all recall that the invocation of abused women in Afghanistan and later on in Iraq, both as a prelude and an accompaniment to US military intervention in the context of the so-called war on terror, had produced the effect of equating feminism with imperialism. Far from inspiring an unqualified response of international feminist solidarity, these invocations provoked sharp critical reactions from many feminists in the North and beyond. Moreover, the designation of these interventions as cultural imperialism had the unintended side effect of locking the women of Afghanistan into an essentialized concept of cultural, cultural indigeneity, reinscribing the categories of the Muslim woman versus the West. Yet, as Edward Said reminded us in his lecture that refuted Huntington's thesis, uh, he said there are no insulated cultures or civilizations. Any attempt made to separate them into watertight compartments does damage to their variety, their diversity, their sheer complexity, their radical hybridity. Afghanistan, I found out, was no exception. Let us be quite clear that just as there are Afghan women dreaming of becoming doctors and lawyers or of joining football and cricket teams, a recent study indicates that some of their urban and educated contemporaries find the Taliban's Islam insufficiently rigorous and aspire to become members of the Islamic State Khorasan province. One of the more disturbing features of the analyses that followed the current Taliban takeover almost a generation later is that the terms of the debate have hardly shifted. While some analysts have celebrated uh, the uh, victory of the Taliban as the definitive defeat of US imperialism, others have declared the end of an alleged era of progress and freedom for Afghan women. The casualty has, as usual, been a serious analysis of how the dysfunctions of US intervention, its counterinsurgency led disregard for civilian lives and built in corruption prepared its own demise and why the type of regime ushered in by the Taliban falls far short of representing the society it purports to be in control of. Yet, whether through pragmatism, opportunism or conviction, accommodations to a new normal abound. Canada's Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Afghan herself uh, 
raised many eyebrows when she referred to the Taliban as our brothers in a plea, no doubt, to ensure safe passage for thousands of fleeing Afghans. A declaration from the United Nations Office of the Commissioner of Human Rights, penned by the Special Rapporteur for Violence Against Women, admonished the Taliban for overlooking the distinction between Sharia, eternal ethical principles, and fiqh, the Islamic legal, legal tradition that is open to interpretation and modification. Thus, seeding that a correct interpretation of Islamic law is the sole basis for defining uh, gender equality or women's citizenship rights. Yet among 50 Muslim majority countries across the, the world, only 18 have constitutions based on Sharia law and 10 have declared Islam as the official state religion without making any direct reference to Sharia. Finally, the exhortations of the United Arab Emirates for the Taliban to adopt a more moderate line on women's rights cannot but ring hollow coming from a polity that practices a guardianship or welaya system that reduces women to being legal minors. I conclude my brief tour of varied gendered landscapes with the sense that the term chasm I used in relation to the polarizing culture wars of the North almost calls for the metaphor of separate galaxies when we move to a more global scale. Is there any hope of finding a mutually intelligible language for claim making and voice in a world where most women and men are locked into coerced identities, while feminists in the North are engaged in sometimes acrimonious debates over identities, bodies, and sexualities. Social movements and their demands are always grounded in local histories of struggle regardless of the global veneer of movements for gender equality and LGBTQ rights. How do we deal with differences in language, meaning and temporality among them? In lieu of an answer which I do not possess, but I hope your deliberations will help to address I propose today to revisit a number of key milestones on the road leading to our current predicament. One of the most widely used frameworks to define our moment centers around the concept of backlash. This concept implies resistance by those who feel threatened by changes to the status quo and reactions to a perceived loss of power when marginalized or disadvantaged groups challenge existing power structures. In historical terms, the extension of recognition, voice and rights to colonial subjects, laboring masses, women, people of color and non-normative sexualities throughout the 20th century has arguably galvanized aggrieved majorities, rallying around slogans laden with moral panic, such as the end of white Christian America or the death of the family. Furthermore, backlash may have transnational, regional and subnational manifestations. It is good to keep in mind that there are now powerful transnational alliances cutting across continents and world religions, aiming above all to establish the principle that matters relating to sexuality, reproductive choice, and the control of bodies do not belong to the sphere of civic deliberation, public choice, or human rights, but to a domain of non-negotiable doctrinal and cultural 
imperatives. A multi-sided project titled Countering Backlash, coordinated by the Institute of Development Studies in the United Kingdom, to which I participate in a minor way by being an advisor, is engaged in developing frameworks to make sense of these changes. And I invite you to visit their website, uh, IDS Countering Backlash. Their work suggests that we are dealing with at least three different types of phenomena. The first type centers around defensive responses that are reactive in nature and restorative in intent. Examples may be found in men's movements, such as fathers' protests against alimony and custody arrangements that they feel favor women. Such movements are relatively new to the Middle East, but may be found in several countries, such as Egypt, where even relatively minor reforms to existing divorce laws have triggered sharp reactions. The same applies to Turkey, where a reactive men's movement is in progress, with, I may add, a lot of um, female followers. Um, the second type is of reaction is offensive, and it makes reference to a paradise lost of patriarchal gender harmony or complementarity using diverse tropes, such as pre-colonial indigenous Islamic golden age, Christian, or other pre-Lapsarian scripts. At the most extreme end of the offensive continuum, we find movements for male entitlement, such as the so-called incels or involuntary celibates, who, as you know, resort to violence and sometimes terrorism. Finally, we find opportunistic alliances of actors with diverse agendas who strategically deploy anti-gender ideology as a glue to rally their socially conservative bases. An excellent example of such instrumentalism is provided by Turkey that was among the first signatories of the Council of Europe's Istanbul Convention uh, to combat violence against women, which became effective in August 1st, 2014. It was also the first and only country to withdraw on 1 July 2021, despite extensive protests, as a result of bargains struck with ultra-conservative Jamaats and the fundamentalist party, which is insignificant in electoral terms, at a point in time when the AKP's popularity was waning and was trying to make an appeal to its pious base. Now, theories of backlash raise the question of whether there are tipping points whereby gradual shifts eventually result in more visible and threatening qualitative changes. Whereas the presence of token minorities might have created little unease at a point when they were not seen as a threat to establish orders, the critical mass represented by grassroots movements such as Me Too or Black Lives Matter may constitute a new threshold. These are all important issues that merit further discussion. But my own reading of our moment stretches somewhat beyond the concept of backlash, since I feel that we also need to account for the fault lines running within feminisms and gender identity debates, and not just types of resistance outside it. This calls for an examination of the internal contradictions and unintended consequences of a series of global encounters which have had major implications for rights advocacy in the global South. For those of you who are unfamiliar with my arguments, 
I shall briefly recapitulate these. The first is the encounter with the global institutionalization of standards and mechanisms for gender equality through the workings of the United Nations, its agencies, and the major international donors. There are multiple excellent accounts, some of the most incisive authored by Latin American scholars, of the diverse ways in which women's movements became depoliticized through co-optation by donor assistant governments and their ecosystems of NGOs. In the Middle East and North Africa region, jumping on the gender bandwagon became a soft option used by numerous authoritarian regimes to indicate uh, their commitment to a democratization process they had no intention of honoring. I had mentioned Turkey earlier um, as an exemplar of the instrumentalization of gender equality concerns, but there is a long, long line of governments in the Middle East using exactly uh, the same techniques. The same logic applies to other attempts to co-opt uh, liberal norms in the domain of gender and sexuality, such as pinkwashing Israel to burnish its democratic credentials, regardless of the human rights abuses perpetrated against Palestinians, or the fact that it is dominated by homophobic religious fundamentalist parties as never before. The second ill-fated encounter took place after the global turn to neoliberalism since the Reagan-Thatcher era. The objectives of women's movements, many of which were explicitly committed to social justice and redistributed goals, were now transformed into technocratic fixes for the empowerment of women within the parameters of a neoliberal market economy. In the West, this gave rise to a triumphalist boardroom or corporatist feminism, extolling the virtues of capitalist markets for women who make it. In the South, meanwhile, the spaces left vacant by the dearth of social services and social welfare were occupied by actors and social movements with conservative agendas and roots in faith-based organizations, whether these be Catholic, evangelical, or Muslim. Populist and religious movements claiming to speak on behalf of the poor, the marginalized, and the powerless in different regional contexts increase their appeal, regardless of the often authoritarian or dogmatic messages that they were putting out. Losing sight of the fact that feminism cannot be divorced from a broader social justice agenda was to exact heavy costs, among which was the trivialization of their concerns as the preoccupations of a privileged elite. By the time I started working in Afghanistan in the early 2000s, gender mainstreaming was well established. I identified at the time the top-down dissemination of new gender norms as a form of donor-driven gender activism that necessitated a new technical vocabulary and tools that were as yet unfamiliar to local women's rights activists. The shift from women to gender that took place over the successive United Nations decades for women between the 1970s and the 1990s eventually led to a bifurcation between the social relations approach prevalent in gender analysis frameworks that were used in development context and the postmodern critical theory inspired corpus of scholarship that became canonical in Northern academia. 
queer studies, which is an offshoot of this latter trend, the strand, distinguished itself through its incisive focus on biopolitics and an expansive analysis of normalizing regimes that also include the liberal logic of sexual minority politics in the West. This brings me to the final and possibly most devastating encounter, which took place in the geopolitical context of the war on terror from the 9-11 events onwards. As I pointed out earlier, the invocation of oppressed Muslim women as part of the rationale for military intervention in Afghanistan and beyond had provoked predictable outrage in the face of its naked instrumentalism. This resulted in a cottage industry of critiques of feminism as imperialism and of gender equality norms as tools in this arsenal of oppression, designated by some, by the way, as governance feminism. The same logic was applied to the area of LGBTQ rights by scholars locating imperial justifications for war in the Middle East in so-called homo-nationalist discourses that present Islam as inherently intolerant and violent as the very antithesis of an allegedly liberal West. This, I argue, has led us to a new epistemic cul-de-sac. Are there any ways of critiquing US imperialism and Western hegemony without becoming entrapped yet again in the sterile binaries of East versus West, tradition versus modernity, secularism versus Islam? How to avoid demonizing and marginalizing rights actors who fall foul of some implicit sanctioned notion of indigeneity. These are crucial questions, which I am not proposing to address here, but I would like to direct you instead to a forthcoming event at the Center of Near and Middle East Studies on September 11th, on September 29th, by Evran Savje, who discusses our book titled Queer in Translation, where she addresses these very issues that I have just skillfully dodged. <laughs> um, to conclude, the gender wars of my title are the product of both external onslaughts that crystallize around so-called anti-gender ideology, which manifests itself in familiar ways across the globe, and also of the contradictions and dysfunctions that are internal to platforms claiming to have a feminist agenda. The challenge before us is to find the imagination and wisdom to forge a new politics of feminist solidarity that resonates across the globe by harnessing the aspirations of younger generations whose anti-authoritarian impulses were on display in the streets of Cairo, Istanbul, Tunis, and Tehran, and not just San Francisco, Madrid, or Warsaw. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Denise, for uh, this talk. A lot in there. And um, I forgot to mention that uh, we have some time for discussion so I encourage people to put their comments and questions and I see there are already a couple before I open it up I just wanted to um, you know follow up on you know one strand of of your talk because I know that many of people in the audience you know will have read your earlier work in which you I mean particularly um, bargaining with patriarchy which has become such a sort of classic and people refer to and try to uh, apply to in different contexts, but I, I know that your thinking has changed quite radically around that. And I mean, that's one thing, you know, that I really appreciate uh, about you and Denise, you know, the sort of, you're actually moving and changing and, and also sometimes 
pausing and saying, well, you know, maybe, you know, I was thinking it at this time, but I now changed my mind. Um, so could you just maybe for a few minutes um, sort of share that shift in terms of your thinking around patriarchy? Um, I mean, when you're speaking about backlash, of course, what comes into mind is your concept of masculinist restoration. How have you moved from the idea of the patriarchal bargain and, you know, you'd already kind of 10 years later kind of reconceptualize that to saying, well, I don't know that patriarchy still really works for me. And can you just say a little bit about that? And then yes, I'll, I'll move really to the question. Because I adopted, Nadia, a rather uh, strict uh, definition of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, I think that it is distinct from systems of male dominance because it also involved intergenerational relations between men, patriarchy in the sense I understood it, which broke down quite substantially and uh, wholesale. Mm -hmm. So that uh, you ha I had to sort of reorient myself to defining polities where male dominance was being kept alive, as it were, through laws, uh, through on the street, by the state, while the material basis of what I used to define as patriarchy had collapsed substantially. Therefore, I had to redefine the politics of this new phase as masculinist restoration, because I no longer consider that uh, male dominance is hegemonic. That is why so much effort is being expended at all levels in maintaining this order and also why it has become so intimately intermeshed with types of governments. In other words, all types of authoritarian governments also presume a particular type of gender order. It seems to come, you know, as a package deal. Mm -hmm. Wherever you see it, I mean, recently you might have read interventions in China banning sissy boys from television. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so there is a sort of ge generalized, I mean, one could catalog these, you know, and have little cases, but there is a clear, and this is probably not new because I also mm -hmm. found historical pronouncements, you know, uh, that I didn't use because I had a short time uh, that indicate that this is a form of politics. Essentially, what I have been struggling to do, Nadia, is to decouple these discussions, especially in the Middle East, mm -hmm. from culturalist interpretations and to bring them squarely into the domain of politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Basically. Yes, yes. I have to say, I was very happy that you pointed to the event Queer in Translation because I just read the book and, you know, I'll be uh, in conversation with Evan and I thought it was fantastic um, and particularly fantastic because I think sort of similar also with you know your work um, you make sure to ground your arguments in political economy uh, and you know challenge the idea of this culturalization you know everything is up to its Islam its Middle East culture um, and Evan does the same when she's speaking about, um, I mean, in, in terms of she's very much sort of linking the specifics of neoliberal Islam and, and looking at political economy. So I, mm. um, but let me move to the questions. And I just also like to remind the audience, um, aside from you being able to put your questions and comments uh, in the Q&A function, that we will, after the keynote, we'll have a uh, musical uh, performance, a recorded musical performance, as well as the opening panel on the same link. So, um, you know, stay with us. Uh, the first question uh, is by Ethan Bonali, uh, who says, I wanted to con congratulate you on the very high level of this webinar. I would like to ask a question about femonationalism. That is that part of feminism that cooperates with white supremacism and patriarchy. In Italy, far-right parties are using the voice of some TERFs, um, such as Marina Terragni, presented as feminists to defeat the approval of a law to protect LGBT people. I wanted to ask you if you have observed the same phenomenon in other countries. Thanks for the reply. Well, I am a little bit puzzled by the choice of feminism to 
uh, designate women who uphold white supremacism and patriarchy. Okay, this is this is the sort of conundrum. I think that uh, unfortunately, and uh, there is a sort of perversion of arguments going on there, uh, which is a domain that really I don't want to venture venture into. Uh, I think that the whole discussion on trans rights and so on has become so convoluted that it is possible to make outrageous uh, parallels. Like, I don't know the person you're talking about, but basically, you know, uh, calling that position a feminist position really rather stretches the imagination, I find. So we, we have to, you know, uh, really, by the way, though, in answer to that question, let me make very clear at the outset that I, in just in this, there is absolutely no way that you can read off political positions from sexualities or from sexual orientations. All you have to do is look at the trans persona of the abortion banning uh, far right Republican Caitlyn Jenner to convince yourself that there isn't any great mileage in trying to find homologies between uh, identities and politics. That I think I want to be very clear about. And this is also the case with, you know, prominent gay Dutch politicians who are openly racist, et cetera. So I think that this is a line, uh, maybe I haven't emphasized this in my talk, but I want to make that absolutely clear. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Denise. Uh, the second question is by Mengia Chaler. Um, how do you think can activists and organizers best support and collaborate with LGBTQI and women's organizations located in Eastern Europe? And how can we best form solidarity networks with Eastern European organizations working with LGBTQI persons? Unfortunately, I know so little about the Eastern European context that I would feel like a total fraud, you know, making any recommendations about a context I know very little about. I personally think that the problem cannot be resolved by attacking it at the level of the issue of LGBTQI rights, but at the level of governance. I mean, I was amazed to find out that as far as Poland is concerned, the Catholic Church is practically in the same relationship as the clergy in Iran, as far as influencing parliament, as far as legislation and so on. Now, without breaking that stranglehold in the same way that in the Islamic Republic of Iran, whatever the citizens' aspirations, as long as the system remains unchanged, you can never have democratic elections, you have a similar problem. So I think that LBGTQI activists should join whatever broader movement exists to shift the existing governance structures or no amount of transnational solidarity is going to help them out. That's what I think. Yeah, well, I, I think that actually uh, Turkey is probably the example par excellence where you have feminist and LGBTQI activists who are at the forefront of challenging authoritarianism, right? Oh. I mean, that's, uh, and actually are uh, maybe the only uh, people left who are, you know, challenging it outwardly, uh, which is um, quite amazing. But I've noticed also in Lebanon that uh, queer feminist activists, um, you know, the very, very, uh, are very concerned about linking their political struggle to issues around, uh, well, challenging sectarianism, challenging political authoritarianism, corruption, as well as um, working with domestic workers in, in Lebanon. So I find that in certainly in the Middle East, much of queer feminist activists, not necessarily the more sort of liberal uh, LGBT activism is very much linking their struggle to a range of different issues. 
Uh, Denise, I was, uh, okay, I see there are some more questions. Okay, here, question from Busta Sati. Uh, why do you think anti-feminist ideology uh, take more physically violent forms in Turkey, especially within the family? Uh, as compared to what? I mean, I think it's pretty violent in Mexico as well. And I think there are the, my own interpretation of the Turkish case uh, has been really that uh, there is a great deal to fight for. Unlike many countries in the Middle East where family laws, et cetera, are really stacked up, you know, uh, against women. Uh, in Turkey, there are two phenomena. First of all, uh, the legislation is still holding. I mean, there's been an onslaught going on against the uh, civic law of 2001 and the criminal code amendment of 2004, but still on the statute books, there's a lot to fight for. Another, and this is my hypothesis, is that the, there is now a huge gap between generations of men and women in Turkey. There is a new generation of women who've achieved education, who've achieved mobility and so on, who are with a generation of men, except the very younger ones whose expectations have not been equally modified. And what I find interesting as a finding in Turkey, there is a very important NGO called the Platform to Prevent Femicides. And what they note is that it is not necessarily women who are not earning or are disempowered who are most subjected to violence, but women who resist. Women who want a divorce, who their partner doesn't want to divorce, daughters who don't want to obey brothers or fathers, and so on. So I think that at the moment, the gender situation in Turkey is a perfect storm in the sense that there is a great deal of resistance and the backlash comes in the form of violence and coercion. I mean, this is to be tested obviously, mm -hmm. but that's my hunch about Turkey. Mm -hmm. Women will simply not submit and they do it openly. Yeah. You know, there is defiance yes. Open, and not just in the big cities. This yeah. is the thing. Yeah. This started, in fact, years ago when the victims of violence, you know, that in Muslim funerals, women do not, you know, do not lift coffins. They don't go to the grave. It's segregated. Years ago, Turkish women started taking uh, the, the funerals of women victims of violence which is a huge form of protest yeah. and the breaking of the taboo as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me move to Ritata, Rita Brata Droy's question. I wanted to ask if in view of these recent developments regarding LGBTQI violence, does the definition of patriarchy change in terms of bringing this violence within its fold? If so, how? Not necessarily uh, in the sense that, as I said earlier, you know, there is one particular definition, you know, of, of you know, hegemonic dominance, which consists in asserting control over bodies, sexualities, and persons to the extent that the LBGTI phenomenon is part of infractions in that domain. You do not need a separate concept to describe forms of oppression directed at, at LGBTQI. Not that I use the same, it fits within my transformed conception of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. I don't, as you know, use the term patriarchy as such, but my patriarchy 2.1 or you know, new version accommodates the oppression of LBG, LGBTQI uh, individuals within the same umbrella. You don't need a, a separate definition of it. Maybe uh, just um, to clarify, because I don't think that maybe people are not familiar. Can you just elaborate a little bit on this sort of re, I mean, we talked about it a bit, but I think that probably the audience would benefit from a clarification. Okay. It comes from the fact that patriarchy was never about only the dominance of men over women, okay? <laughs> that, that is not, you know, how it works. Initially, 
it was about literally the patriarchal domination of male in power holding positions, usually of the older generation, controlling the property, mobility, marital prospects, and sexualities of the younger generation, men and women. To that extent, I always explained in my own work the pro-feminist leanings of the early Middle East reformers as a reaction to the type of governance and the type of patriarchy they had in their households, okay? So that is what I mean when, we, when I say we don't need a new definition of patriarchy. Um, for that, I refer you to an article I wrote ages ago called uh, The Paradoxes of Masculinity, which was in a, in a book edited by Lance, Nancy Lindisfarne and Andrea Cornwall. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, maybe I'm going to take a couple of questions, Denise. Um, okay. One by Victoria Shire. How can we shift the cultural discourse of Islamic culture versus Western culture towards a rather polit political economy analysis methodologically in academic research? Right, so that's the first one. And then Noor Sinem Kuru, thank you for that great speech. My question is about women's participation in politics and voting choices in Turkey. How should we understand and interpret women in AKP as party members and voters? Right. So the first question about the shift from cultural discourse towards political economy and the second one more specifically about women in the AKP. I'm quite desperate about the first one because I really don't think we can. If you look at the analyses following the Taliban takeover, you would think that no research is done as nothing happened in the 20 years intervening, okay? I think that it is now uh, too entrenched and useful a tool, facile though it is, that is why it keeps coming back and back and we don't seem to be able to, to get rid of it. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. All my professional life, I really tried very hard to complicate the picture and to show all the other layers intervening uh, that actually make a culturalist interpretation extremely narrow and practically useless. Was it a success? I think not, okay? So one keeps going. As for Noor, thank you. This is my favorite question. <laughs> uh, because Noor asked me about how we understand the female followership of the AKP, which is a very important question because there was a particular point where there were more female voters than male. In fact, 52% of women, as opposed to 48% men, something like that, who voted for the AKP. And my answer is in two parts. First, politics, like all regimes, uh, the AKP also had its female beneficiaries. These are the women of the ruling entourage who exist everywhere. They exist in the Soviet Union, they exist in Iran, they exist in Saudi Arabia and so on, you know? Uh, these are the women who are the beneficiaries of the positions, the businesses, the media, etc., created being part of the ruling clique. What is more interesting for me is the majority of women who are from the popular classes. And there I think the answer is simply that the AKP has been extremely successful in providing welfare and other services at the neighborhood level through many municipalities answering to the needs of these women who are many of them recent rural to urban migrants and who are included in the politics through what I call citizenship as entitlement. They became for the first time bearers of rights in their persons, not least because the welfare uh, help given to women was directed at women. The cash transfers were not given to the male heads of households, but just like these programs in Latin America and elsewhere, they were given to women. Now, 
how is it that these women were voting for the AKP uh, at the same moment that at another level, the government was trying to claw back on women's rights in Turkey? That was actually my return to the patriarchal bargain, if you like, in the same way that women sought protection in households under patriarchal arrangements, these women were accepting the deal of being women as the AKP wanted them to be against the advantages of participating in this grassroots, which by the way was very emancipatory. Women were given literacy classes, they got help with their children at school and so forth. So, I think that, you know, between these two phenomena, there is, to me, no surprise at all. However, I'm not sure that this is continuing successfully. Uh, paradoxically, first, there were cracks among the AKP elite, because initially, uh, the women who were running a government-approved uh, NGO were not happy about withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention. And there was a whole debate where uh, the president had to choose between very conservative constituencies and women of his party, but that was resolved in the manner I, I explained. Uh, and also now with the economic crisis and the erosion of the safety nets, uh, I do not know whether the voter base and the women in the voter base are in the same place. Thank you, Denise. I'll take one more question before the musical interlude. And the question is by Ashis Parveen. Well, I just saw that there's a second question. So I'll just take these two questions and then we'll uh, stop. So Ashis Parveen is asking, cultural norms on gender have helped the authoritarian governments in the Middle East with serious reservations towards gender equality to rule for long? That's just it, you see. <laughs> Uh, when we say cultural norms on gender, on gender mm. uh, the norms that the authoritarian governments, that's their real problem. The norms that they are upholding are in many ways no longer valid. Because when you look at younger generations in Turkey and in many other places in the Middle East, the truth is that their aspirations and their lifestyles and so on are in advance, have moved beyond uh, the way in which the governments render culture for their political purposes. In other words, they are having a serious difficulty in reaching out to that youth. And for example, in Turkey, the AKP is very aware of that phenomenon because uh, poll after poll is suggesting that certainly the Z generation, but even the millennials and the X generation, those who have not known any other form of rule, are way in advance in terms of their marital choices, professional choices, and so on. So when, uh, say, a government like the AKP tells women to stay at home and have three children, in reality, there is very little uh, realistic uptake <laughs> for these policies, not least since things have become so hard, it's become so hard to get the money together to even marry, let alone, you know, uh, that the two earner family is becoming a, a necessity, okay? So I think that the real uh, challenge to these governments is that the sociological realities of their countries are running ahead of them making it more and more difficult for them to contain a new critical citizenry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Denise, uh, thanks so much for your patience. One more question and uh, you'll have to answer very quickly. So this is by Mahtab Dadasifat Mahboub. Thank you for the talk. My question is about the relationship between queer feminist activist groups and the ruling states in the Middle East. Would you say that the states have the intention, the capacity to fulfill these movements' demands in view of neoliberalism on the rise and non-state actors gaining more power? Uh, this is a very difficult question because in the 
in the um, process of fulfilling aspirations, whatever they may be, some rather uh, horrible things can happen. Look at Iran, for instance. Iran has decided, and I believe Afsane Najbabadi wrote about that, has decided to address the question of, uh, of sex change, okay? And what have they done? They have even, they have sponsored sex change operations. At one point, I believe, they were even subsidized. Now, why was that? Because what they could not encounter was any untidiness. So if somebody was gay and wanted to be a male gay and wanted to be with a man, this person had to have a female body. So basically the sex change operation had turned into a tool for forced castration, essentially. I don't know if you saw these heartbreaking documentaries of Iranian gays that had to undergo sex change operation. The only reason I'm mentioning this is that there's a paradox there because we have reached a stage where the government cannot ignore the phenomenon, but the way they deal with it can be catastrophic, <laughs> okay? So uh, I'm not, I don't know exactly what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is that governments that are authoritarian will by definition impose a rigid gender order, even under the cover of accommodating non-normative sexualities. I'm sorry, I think this is a very yes, dark it, answer, but that's all I could think of. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise, uh, for not only a uh, you know, very thought-provoking, inspiring keynote, but also um, taking each question seriously and engaging with it and providing us with so many insights. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm now going to uh, shift gear and introduce, uh, well, virtually because unfortunately can't be with us, but um, the Palestinian cellist, uh, Faris Amin has actually recorded a performance, an improvised performance that uh, is inspired by the theme of the conference. So Faris Amin is a cellist, a composer and music teacher from Palestine. He's in Ramallah. And Faris' passion for music drove him to delve into a vast variety of genres, styles and settings, from collaborations with musicians, dancers and actors, to performances with various ensembles and solo recitals. Other than performing classical Arabic music, he improvises and composes music that tells a story through the sound of the cello. Faris completed his bachelor degree in music in Germany in 2019. So I hope you'll enjoy this brief musical interlude. Sorry, just give me one moment. I'm going to try and fix it.
Well, many thanks to Faris for this incredible, incredibly moving and beautiful performance. Of course, moments like that, I do wish that we would be together in a physical space. Uh, we're going to uh, now take a two minute break and uh, then we will uh, continue with the opening panel. So we'll stay in the same Zoom link, but just give, give everyone a short break. Thank you very much. <laughs> 